Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar, and we are all very, very grateful to the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this webinar a reality. Um, I would also like to thank all of the Bright Start Foundation staff for helping me to get this ready. Um, and welcome to everybody who's here. <laughs> Um, I hope we can have a really enjoyable time today. I don't know what it's like where you are right now or, or what you're doing um, or, or how it feels in your home right now. And this is a very uh, unusual experience for me because normally if I'm inviting a child into my room to play, um, I start out as the listener <laughs> and not the speaker. And so that's maybe the first thing for us to start out as. If we're going to encourage a lot of communication, we must be the listeners and not always the speakers. So I always make sure to try and prepare my body, that I'm taking a deep breath in, relaxing my shoulders, uh, relaxing my stomach, or like any areas where I might feel tense or stressed out because we are feeling a lot of that lately, most likely. Um, to be prepared to listen, we use our whole body. So if everyone wants to just take a moment to take in a deep breath, let their shoulders fall. Let their stomach be a little loose and relax, and then we can get started. Um, so I'm going to, as I said, we're, you know, we have to start as listeners, but you're going to be at home with your children. So you will be the listeners today, and um, I'm about to throw a lot of information at you, and you can pick and choose what works best for your family. And and then we'll have some time for a question and answer. So you can check in with me or clarify anything that I'm talking about or just ask how to adapt it better to your home. And then we'll have a time for you guys to, to play and try some things out with your children and I will, and I will be here later for more questions and answers. Um, so I'm going to um, share my screen just briefly. Uh, we don't want to spend too much time staring at the screen. <laughs> Hold on just a second here. All right, this is just to make sure that I, I'm sorry, that was the wrong thing. <laughs> um, this is just for me to make sure that I get all the points and that I wanna make sure um, we all hear. So the first thing about play, um, this is not, it is incredibly educational, it is explorative, and it is necessary for communication, and it is the basis of all of our relationships. Um, so if you think of a parent and a child getting to know each other and getting to know facial expressions and getting to know everyone's different movements, um, this is the beginning of communication and it's the why we communicate with other people. And so it gives our children motivation to practice all those harder exercises at school that, that they need to learn, um, that they need to use to, to practice skills. But this play gives them the motivation to practice those skills. Um, it gives them a reason to want to reach out and tell somebody about how they're feeling or what they're doing today. So always go for the smile. If your child is frustrated or overstimulated, we stop. <laughs> it doesn't have to go on. It doesn't have to be a, a forced exercise at all. And there are ways to invite children back in. This is also um, led by the child. So I have found so often in play that, um, you know, again, we are the listeners. So the child will, will start playing, acting, jumping, and we can jump along with them. Um, we can sit quietly with them. Uh, I find that when children are singing songs, if I repeat what they're singing, instead of trying to teach them a song, um, they will actually add a lot more variation. They will actually add more words. They will, they will do a lot more with that song if they know that I am listening than if they think that I'm telling something <laughs> to them or trying to make them do something else. Um, right, and I already said allowing for the child to engage or disengage and return. And this is also very important um, because it allows the child to learn to self-regulate. So they can, if the game is overstimulating or too exciting, they can leave for a moment, relax, and, and you can just simply wait for them to come back or there, there are ways for you to like sit with them and, and create motions that will bring them back. So it doesn't have to, it's not like school where they would have to sit um, or you know, 
complete an activity entirely. This gives them a chance to be more aware of their body if they're noticing, this is too much, I need a break. Or, okay, now I'm ready. And then they can take the initiative to return. And that's very, very, very important that they have an active role in, in play and communication. Um, also, it, it combines, play combines our mind, our body, our emotions. It's very important that we get to integrate all of these things. Um, all of our very important school activities tend to focus on like one specific skill at a time, whether it's, you know, fine motor skills or language skills. Play puts them all together. And neurologically, that's very important for your body and your mind. And for children who also might be um, dealing with overstimulation from different sensory experiences, if things are too loud or too, the textures are strange, um, learning to play can get them into a place where they can start to integrate a lot of those experiences a little more easily. Um, we don't have to overwhelm them with experiences, but it does gradually help to open up to novel situations. You know, depending on everyone's child, I know everyone's child is a, is a different comfort level. Um, right, keeping, like, as I said, keeping stimulation balanced is key, so we don't want a child to be too understimulated, we don't want them to be too overstimulated. So if your child prefers to play with one simple object in a very still space, that is completely wonderful. Um, if they need to have a lot of room, we'll just talk about maybe having like a safe area in your house where they can play. Um, right, because sometimes we need really big movements and sometimes we need small movements and those are different types of regulations. So we can um, if you have questions about your individual child's needs as far as movement and safety, uh, we can talk about that in the question and answer period. And, you know, this, the title of this uh, webinar has a lot to do with storytelling and communication. Um, but again, I'm just underlining that movement is our first form of communication. Um, and it carries us from excitement to relaxation. We can go back and forth through all these different feelings with with movement and just um, acknowledging our movements. And um, like I said, to be a listener in movement is to imitate the child. It's like to match their motion and match it. And then they say, ah, they noticed. They know what I'm doing. They're doing this with me. They can feel that. Like if they're, if they're swaying back and forth and you sway with them, you might notice that they, ah, oh, something's happening. And then if you do that and they're very comfortable and you, you change the emotion, they, they're like, oh, maybe, maybe they can do that too. So that's something to play with. That's part of just being a listener with your body. Um, right, and here we have, we've talked about this already with the imitation and emotional regulation. Um, the third one down, I wanna stress that stressful emotions can be welcome in play. Um, often I work with children who are dealing with a lot of stressful emotions that they aren't verbally expressing. And so it can be important for a child to experience um, some frustration or to, um, you know, act out a little anger in play is safer than doing it, you know, in real life and having a tantrum. And so I would say like, we can welcome all feelings and there's a way to match the child and say like, oh, this is, this makes us so angry. And then slowly, slowly bring it down. And with your body, show them like, this is how we're, we're calming down. Um, and also like whatever your child prefers to calm down because we all, we all have our special, special preferences. Um, I also want to say that it's very, very normal and important to repeat over and over. Um, I've had children come to my playroom because they had experienced a type of crisis and they weren't able to talk about it, um, even though they were able to speak. And the child would come to my room every day <laughs> and we would act out a story from their favorite TV show over and over and over and over. And I was starting to wonder like, is this really helping? <laughs> is this changing anything? He was still very, um, he was still having trouble at home. He was still having a little bit of trouble at school, but eventually that repetition gave him a feeling of safety. He, he knew that he could come into the room. We had a routine. We would act it out together. And because it was routine, we could act out things with a lot of energy um, 
we were actually race car drivers and we would race our cars, <laughs> pretend to race our cars around the room. And, um, but there was a safe way to do that because we did it the same way every time. And because we did it the same way every time, it felt safe. So this routine gave us a place to experience very intense emotion. And after, I don't know if it was six weeks or eight weeks or even longer, um, we were playing our race car game and racing our cars and slowing them down and racing our cars and slowing them down. And eventually he hopped up on a chair and gave this speech, <laughs> which was actually from the movie, but was related perfectly to the experience he was having um, at home with the crisis that his family was experiencing. And I, I think it was the movement and the routine and the repetition and the fact that somebody played the game with him that allowed him to like finally come out with this big statement. And that, that helped him then to start talking about things that happened at home, things that his family was dealing with, all the changes that they were dealing with. And it really helped, even though I think a lot of people would have said like, why are you just letting him play this TV show every day? So if your child has a favorite show <laughs> that they play all the time, there, there might be a way to use that. Um, all right, we'll see. Ah, okay. Another thing I wanted to mention very quickly, uh, when we're, if we're doing art with children, if you're drawing, one way to encourage storytelling or, or language with the art is to, um, well, I'll say like we often react to children's drawings by saying, this is the most beautiful drawing I've ever seen. And I, I welcome you to do that. I, if your child is excited about a drawing, please share their excitement. But we also, um, we have to remember to show them that we actually see it and that we are noticing it and that there's things they can notice. And this is very important. Um, so, you know, if I was looking at this drawing with a child, I'd be like, oh, the center of this is such a bright orange. It reminds me of the sunset. Um, that pink is so soft. And then the lines go up and down and up and down and up and down and all these curves. Um, like, wow, that blue is very bright over there. And I think I can see a creature walking through the middle. And this, this shows the child that you are noticing. And it's just like the imitating a song or imitating a movement. It's showing them that you heard them, that you noticed what they put down. They might then notice things they didn't even realize they did. And that makes them much more aware of what they're putting on paper and what their movements are doing and then they can think about what their movements are doing and that's a wonderful mind-body connection. Um, I'm also just gonna, um, I hope I'm not going too fast but please write down your questions <laughs> if, if we need them. Um, all right so this is another example um, of a storytelling tool that I used with uh, a young boy who had come to my playroom because he had also had a, a crisis at home and was having a lot of difficulty. Um, he did not have a way to express it. And so he was having a, a lot of trouble acting out at school and, and trying to get um, a lot of extra care from, from teachers and from his parents. And um, because this had happened at home, I had a dollhouse and I had all of these little little dollhouse people, all different, you know, ethnicities, all different costumes, every, you know, anything. <laughs> like I've gone to great lengths to get very realistic dollhouse people and nobody wanted to use them. Nobody liked them. They were hard and they were stiff and they didn't look ex exactly like anyone. Um, so after weeks of like playing with these dollhouse people and, and he's not enjoying them, um, I just wanted to make like something that would feel comforting. So I made like a little pillow, a tiny little pillow that he could squeeze and he grabbed it and he was like, mom. <laughs> so we put eyes and you'll see like the one on the left with the big red buttons, that's mom. Um, the one in the middle is him and the one on the right is his brother. And we wound up, he, he became infatuated with these, I think just because he could squeeze them. And he could also like, they could argue. He would press them together and they would argue or they would take care of each other. And there are all these movements um, that he could use to show the different relationships. You can also see that they're laying on these little um, pink cloths so that they had um, 
different rooms and the rooms could be put together or taken apart. And this, this just showed daily how he was feeling <laughs> about everyone in the family. Um, and so he didn't have to use a lot of words, but he showed a tremendous amount of awareness of what was happening and how he was feeling. And then I was able to say, like, oh, they want to be close today. I'm like, oh, no, they're so far away. They can't see each other today. That's so, that's so hard. And so this helped him then to have some reflection and acknowledgement of what he was feeling and that what he was feeling wasn't, didn't have to be so scary, that it might be normal and we could talk about it. So it is very important. Sometimes stressful feelings do come out and play and play is, can be a very important stress release. And um, I'm also happy to answer any questions about that. Uh, if you need to, but these, these were an amazing tool. And he, just because he could squeeze them <laughs> was the most important part. And I found other children have really enjoyed this as well, just to have something that is textured and comforting um, and can absorb a lot of energy. And eventually we wound up making, I think a couple dozen, one for his classmates and for his teachers and for, so that he could explore all the different relations he had everywhere. And really in his mind, it was like his world was kind of coming together. Um, he didn't have to use a lot of words. It was, it was just a, a lot of um, movement and rearranging and um, different levels of intensity. So I think it was a really uh, important experience. Uh, I'm going to stop my share here. And um, we do have, I'm trying to keep an eye on the time so that we have, <laughs> um, we have time for questions. Um, I'm going to ask Kari to get a couple of videos prepared. In just a, a moment, I just wanted to let you know um, the videos here that I'm going to show. I really just wanted to show to set the mood. Um, this is this is from a school, an Italian school of dance and music for children, and called Segni Mosi. And I don't expect you to have to work from a. Uh, <laughs> I know that you don't have a dance studio in your house. I know that you don't have a giant swing. That's fine. But what I, I want you to notice is that um, the children in the videos are doing a lot of research for movement. They're testing um, jumping, <laughs> they're testing um, intensity, they're testing like interaction um, and controlling their bodies. That's also very, very important for sensory integration. So it, it will give us some ideas of um, different ways to use our body and drawing and, and research in different ways. Um, it's also nice to see that like they use movement and then there's drawing or art. And in that way, there's a trace of the movement afterwards. Um, I think that will be obvious when we see the film, but then that, that tracing and drawing of the movements gives a way to say, like, Oh, look, you jump so high, you jump so low. And that's the beginning of, of storytelling and, and communication also. Um, and I also just want to note the mood. <laughs> there is, it's very exciting. It's very fun. Um, Kids also seem to be just taking their time to do what they would like to do, and um, it's very physical. So I just wanted to give a few samples, and if it's something you think you would like to learn from, uh, you can um, check them out on, they have videos on YouTube and programs and things. So um, Hari, if we could get the first video ready to go.
on the chat. Um, I'm going to get back to that in just a moment. Um, and I hope those weren't too long. Um, but I, I do, I especially love the, um, the video with the, the fabrics because it does show that um, you can use any household item to play and like create different movements. Um, I don't have a partner with me here, but even um, just having the little scarf. <laughs> You know that you can throw up into the air and let it fall. Um, you can do that at different paces and variations, so it's a little bit musical. Um, there's always the favorite hide and seek. <laughs> so you can let your child play with a very simple, safe object and create an enormous amount of variation. And that is um, research into the environment. It's research into the laws of physics and nature. Um, it's also really fun to be doing something together. Um, so I'm. No, I think it's about time for our question and answer. I do also have a couple um, quick things I want to show you um, before I get to all of those questions. So um, one thing uh, I wanted to show you is that we had, we, we just gave you all these examples for like big spaces um, and getting into a big space. I do notice there's a question I was starting to answer about um, bringing a child to a big space, like a, a gymnastics class or a gym, and it's quite possible that um, it's it's overwhelming or too loud or there's too many people so it might be really easy to like ask for a one-on-one -on -one introduction to the space and have a few visits um, ahead of time just so that the child doesn't have to 
deal with so much stimulus at once if they can get to used to the the echoes in the space and the light of the space and and one or two teachers they can go to then maybe it won't be so hard to take in the noise of all the other children um also like sharing videos and pictures ahead of time and and i don't know if any kids are using any relaxation techniques um but if it's okay for them to you know practice like oh i am nervous too i'm nervous too <sighs> okay <laughs> let's let's try and go in it or I'm going to answer more about that one in the chat, but I, I see that we are, um, I want to make sure we have time to play. So for little tiny spaces, if you're in a home with a little tiny space, um, I do sometimes have like a little, a little space like this. Um, this right here is like a Delta sand or a moon sand. It's kind of like rubber shavings. It's, um, it's a very soft texture that I find most children really enjoy. Again, it has like that squeezing that's comforting and actually teachers would come into my room all the time and just, put their hands in it and start using it. So it can be a really, really nice calming activity, especially if you've maybe been playing a lot and you sense your child is a little exhausted um, or overwhelmed. This is a good grounding material. If you don't have something like this, if you can have like a little bucket um, of soil or I know we're all making um, slime and those kinds of things, anything squeezable can be really good for relaxing and bringing something down. And so also if you have a child going to a place where they're a little nervous, taking a stress ball or something that they can squeeze so they can squeeze and breathe, squeeze and breathe, um, might help them practice calming their body. Um, when I lay with a small space like this and we wanna bring in objects that are a little bit more some uh, maybe storytelling wise, I do have lots of like little play figures you know, so it could be something that's sort of symbolic or representational. Um, it could be something that is completely sensory. We're just rolling the ball and feeling it on our body and, and noticing how we're feeling it on our body. And so um, one other thing we'll do is an object that brings up a memory. So for a lot of children, going to the doctor is a very stressful or just bewildering event. So I do have a couple items in my room also you know, about going to the doctor so that we can play. Um, they can pretend to be the doctor um, or, you know, I would be the doctor. And we talk about like, was the doctor mean or are they helping? This is a very important question. Or we can just help them like get used to things that they would see there. And that might be another uh, important aspect of introducing a child to a new environment, like letting them see some of the, um, the unfamiliar objects or unfamiliar experiences they would see at the doctor's office or the gym or at school. Give them a few things to play with ahead of time that might help them get used to it. Um, I feel like I'm throwing quite a lot of information at you right now. Um, so before we get to um, go play, I'm, I wanted to make sure that um, we did things with items that you could just have in the house. Um, and so you, could, you can find any kind of fabric in the house to play with your child, you can find any kind of ball or round thing or anything that would move. That's this way you can um, have very movement-based play. Or if you have pictures or things that remind you of other people um, or places you've been together, you could look at those and like pretend to like, how does grandpa walk? And how does grandma walk? Let's walk like grandma and grandpa. Um, that might be a way to introduce a game. And uh, also items that are that can be comforting in case we need a break. Um, and and uh, I think that's good, but I think um, that might be the challenge to go and find something in your home that can be useful um, in one of those ways. So if you wanna start glancing around right now, um, and I can't see all of your faces, <laughs> so I don't know if that sounds very frustrating or if that sounds um, okay, but I'm gonna you know welcome questions now uh, so that we can get prepared to go and have some playtime with kids. Oh, I also um, wanted to note, uh, to note that uh, you would see like in the, I'm gonna check the questions while I say this. Um, you would see that in the games that they were playing in the videos, like none of those drawings had to look like anything to be considered research or to be considered a story or an experience. Like it could be completely movement based and you can go back and talk with the child like, oh, you went around in circles so many times. Um, or they can notice that they went around in circles so many times. Or today you went back and forth. And so 
that brings together the movement and the experience in the language without having to make a drawing that looks like a giraffe or anything else. Um, so I'm gonna check in with some of these questions here. Uh, yeah. Um, so I'm typing in this. Um, yeah, okay, so as, as far as I think, I'm gonna go back to this question about introducing your child to a space that might be very overstimulating. Um, uh, I don't know if that question was answered by what I was saying before, but a, a slow introduction can be very, very helpful. Um, being able to, to go and walk around, um, being able to have pictures maybe of the inside of the building um, and they could bring the pictures and like have a scavenger hunt, like let's find a ball, let's find the, you know, the gym mats, let's find the bathroom. Just being orientated to a space can be very helpful. Um, getting to know who to ask for help uh, can be very helpful. And if your child would have any, you know, needs as far as self-regulation, like is there a place they can go if they're overstimulated? If the lights are too bright and it's too noisy, do, ne do they know there's a place they can go and sit down? And, and it's gonna be okay for them to sit down and then be able to come back. Um, I think it might also, um, hopefully teachers can coordinate with that. I think also um, having a lot of active play at home can also help with, um, sometimes we're overstimulated by our own movements. And so it is really important to have like gymnastics class and gym and, and movement, but um, we have to get used to like our bodies moving and doing things maybe that we didn't expect or, um, Sometimes children who are, who are having trouble integrating all their senses, like their own movements might surprise them sometimes. And so having, having just play and active play might help familiarize a, a child to their own body. And you can say like, oh, okay, so we, we did somersaults today at home. You're going to do that same thing in this new place. So I think for a lot of kids, um, even when they're coming to my playroom and it's very small, um, we have to take a lot of time to orientate them to, to the room and let them know that like, you know, are the, you know, are the lights too bright? Do we use a lamp instead of the overhead light? Um, is, it, is it too big of a space? So we like move the table so we have a little cozy space that feels a little bit better. You can individualize all of those things. Um, so I, I hope that was helpful. I'm gonna check the other, see if there are other questions. No, I think, is that the only one? Okay, so I wanna, um, I want you all to have a little bit of time to go and find some objects that you can play with with your child. I'm gonna be here to take in more questions. Um, and if you wanna just let us know through the chat what you found that they might like, whether it's something that is um, comforting and soft, whether it's something that involves a lot of movement, um, if it involves a memory, <laughs> um, good or bad. Uh, and you can use, you know, a large space or a small space if you have one. So I'm giving you quite a lot of, of open parameters because I don't know what you're working with. Um, if you have any questions, I'm right here. And uh, in a little while, we will come back. And while, um, while people are checking in with their child and trying to do like some imitation or see if you can come up with one shared movement um that would be that would be amazing if there's one shared movement that you can come up with you know if you're if you're both playing with the scarf and, and you realize it's it's fun for both of you to pull it really tight and then let go and pull it really tight and let that go if that's your first game that's great um yes i can also um Har, i see your i see your message here um and i can Yes, I can talk about um, different examples also from our experience. Um, I'll say that, you know, we've talked a lot about integration and like mixing all of these different things, which I think is very important and a very rich experience. But I also think that um, I have met children who need like a very like small, <laughs> small and isolated um, 
sensory experience to get started. And I do you know like somebody has also mentioned like it's sometimes it's hard to invite a child to a big group activity. Sometimes they're not quite ready to jump into the group. And so one way to bridge that might be to say, um, like for instance, I had one child who would come into the room and I had a little low table that they could reach. They really wanted to walk a lot, but they were a little unsteady on their feet. Um, and they were very motivated by sound. This um, child was also blind, so um, sound was essential. And also getting to know the room very carefully was essential. So I put out a little table and I, around the edge of the table, I would just place um, some jingle bells. I was like tied, um, whenever I use jingle bells, I put a bunch of them together and tie them very tightly so they're too big to put in your mouth. Um, so the jingle bells would be on the table and then a big bell and then a tiny xylophone. And so there were all these different sounds that they could, the child could travel to and they could walk to each one and ring the bell. And it was, the child was like a scientist. It was amazing. They would stop, they would ring the bell, they would tap it on the table. Um, and it was and they go around constantly and do this. It was, it was really beautiful. And then as they were, got very comfortable with the room, I would let them know, hey, I'm over here and I'm gonna ring this bell over here. And then we could have a little conversation. <laughs> um, I also see a new question saying, um, how to relieve stress and tension on parents in order to not affect kids. And I'm so glad you asked that, Sarah. Um, it's, it is really, really important. Um, because like I said, if we're gonna be a listening body, uh, we have to be aware of all of like our own tension because we, children do feel that, especially children um, where movement might be their best communication, they're going to feel it quite suddenly. Um, and when we're busy or there's lots of stressful things happening in the world, that is essential. Um, and it's very difficult to tell parents like, well, you need to find time for yourself because when do you do that? But I do think sometimes play can be a way for us also to relieve some stress. Um, if we can say like, play is so important that I need to set aside the other things I'm, that are on my list of things to do. I need to be able to please um, uh, enjoy myself for a moment and enjoy myself with my child. So I think the first thing is to give yourself permission to play, that it is essential, it is foundational, it's not just recess, it's not just um, taking a, a quick break so that you can get back to school, like, it is essential. So give yourself that time. And I find that um, play also loosens up adults. So being able to play and move, um, do some yoga with your child if they enjoy that, um, find quiet spaces with them if they enjoy that is helpful. Um, it is also very, very important for parents to be able to speak to other parents uh, who are going what they're going through, whatever, whatever that is. Because just like our children wanna know that like we see them, like I see that that was difficult. I see that that was fun. You know, I, I see that you made the biggest circle in the world. Like we need other adults to tell us like, I know how hard that is. Um, or you did an amazing job today. Like that's great. So make sure you have a support network. Um, if you have your own creative practice, if you like to draw, if you like to knit, if you like to cook, um, make sure that you have some chance to do that um, and that you have other people to do it with you. Um, oh yes, um, I see the question here. Um, somebody was asked, asking about um, sometimes Kids feel so shy to act out, and this gives us a hard time to let them act out any story. Um, this, is, this is true, um, if, especially if you're in a large group, and so they're, it's, the group might be very overstimulating, so it would be really okay to um, you know, maybe start with one child and one teacher off to the side, and then help them to slowly integrate. Um, if they don't feel too self-conscious in the group, I, I might sit next to them. And if they even like barely reached out for a toy or like barely raised their hand, I would sit by them and like raise my hand with them or just, you know, make sure that they could have the toy. And just so that like any, any sign of initiative is um, 
I don't want to say rewarded, but answered or responded to. Like, honor those tiny, tiny initiatives. And, and they can grow. I, I worked with a, a lot of children who were visually impaired. And very often, um, people would like grab their hands and say, come on, do this as, as an invitation, but it puts them in a very passive position. If, if they're just waiting for everyone to tell them what to do and grab their hands and, and move them around. But if a child, if I waited, <laughs> waited, um, and a child reached out just a little bit to touch something, and I know that's a, that's a risk. You know, if you can't see what's out there, that's, it's a risk to reach out. So I would just make sure that like that initiative was honored like that initiative to reach out for something um that it was a safe experience that they weren't going to touch anything sharp that it was going to be enjoyable for them and that i could notice like what did you find like and i could tell them like okay there's there's nothing else in front of you except one other toy can you find the one other toy so i think just breaking it down into very small steps can really help and also to make sure you're valuing any, any tiny little initiative that you, that the child puts out. It's, that's much more valuable to me, like one tiny reaching out than anything I would make them do by moving them around the room. Um, I, I hope that's helpful. If, if not, you can um, ask more. Um, how do you help a child who is socially challenged and they do not want to play with others but alone? Um, I, there's, there's a, a balance here. Um, sometimes there are children who are socially challenged. Um, they have a hard time connecting, but they really want to connect. And that is different from a child that is just more comfortable being alone. Um, I know some children who like want to play, want to be active, and, like see other kids and like want to go over there and then are just not sure how to match um, the game that the other children are playing. They don't, they're not sure of the rules and, or, you know, they're having trouble with, with social cues. Um, and that can be really frustrating and difficult for the child. Um, one way to help that is to play act and role play um, in a fun way, like <laughs> what to do, how to meet those kids. And maybe like you could be one of the kids and say like, I'm playing a game, you know, I'm, I'm playing baseball. Can you play baseball? Like what, you know, what actions am I doing? And, and notice their body language and see if you can imitate it. And then um, this might be a way to like have the child become more familiar with like, oh, this means hello. And this means like, hmm, I'm not ready to say hello. And um, sometimes watching videos of social interaction also can be really helpful for kids because they can like analyze it from afar and be like, oh, okay, this is the action I need to use um, to tell people I want to play. Um, I, ho I hope that's helpful. But I also think it's, it's fair, like some children do need some time alone. And so if you have a child who likes to have time alone, and sometimes that worries parents, but if they are capable of making contact with some friends and when they want to make friends, they're able to do that, I think it's okay for them to have some time alone. I mean, I'm, you know, there are a lot of people who like to just have more time alone and that's, that's okay. I do sometimes talk to kids who feel very pressured to go out and make friends and then it feels like an assignment and not like fun. So I wouldn't um, press it too hard, but maybe just give like little building blocks um, to, to break into a group. So I hope that is, that is helpful. And I'm not sure if anybody's been able to find any materials at home that they would like to use for movement play. Um, if anybody has found something that's related to a memory or that relates to a sensory play that your child really enjoys, it might be helpful to other parents to, to get to see, to get to hear that or have other ideas. So if you put it in the chat, I can share that with everyone. Um, let me make sure I'm getting all the questions here. And it's so it's so strange when I can't see anyone because I I am used to like responding more to 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 movement and and gestures than I am to to the questions.
Um, and so while we're waiting for another question, uh, let me think of another good example. Um, yeah, I had, um, I had a little boy who was coming to the art room. Um, he could not see and he could not hear. Um, so all of his sensations had to come through uh, texture and, and rhythm and uh, incredibly, incredibly agile because he was so aware of his body just from having to move and because his entire universe was sort of inside of his body. Um, but it was very hard for him to make contact with other people um, because he couldn't see any social cues. He also could not, um, you know, speak to them. And so we would have um, a practice where he would come in and he would find an object that he liked the sound of and he would tap on it. And so I would tap back. And it seems like a very small thing. But then we change it. And so then I would, every once in a while, I would try to change it too and see if he would get the response. And that's the beginning of a conversation or some type of pattern of a conversation. Um, another good example of that, and I wish I had a good picture to show you, but I had a young boy who was coming to the room and he could understand speech very well, but he was having, um, some surgeries on his throat and couldn't speak and could be incredibly frustrated because he had so much to say and it wasn't coming out. Um, and he was getting very angry in class and, and very frustrated with everything. And we would sit and um, we, we came to the art room a lot of time, could not find anything that he liked. So I, if, uh, if you're trying to start playing with your child and nothing's working, that's okay. That can be part of the process. But I was asking, um, I, I just kept going through trying to find out what he liked and he kept drawing shapes. So I had these little um, plastic shapes. They were like uh, triangles and squares and circles have, um, in different colors. And I would put them on a light box um, because the light was very enjoyable to him. He really liked the stimulation of the light. And so, he was looking, looking at the light and it was very easy then for him to see these shapes and it was a very stimulating activity for him that he would stay engaged in. And I started matching um, a note to each shape. So he, if the square was the low note, um, the circle was the medium note and the triangle was the high note. And once he realized I matched them consistently um, and I didn't, I wasn't using words because he wasn't using a lot of words. Um, he would put them out in a row. And so if he did square, circle, triangle, yeah, square, circle, triangle, it would be like square, circle, triangle. And then he'd do it again and go square, circle, triangle. And then he looked at me and he messed them all up and he rearranged them. And I was like, triangle, circle, square, triangle, circle, square. And once he realized I was doing that, it opened a whole box and we started writing songs. Where, and then we had to add all different new shapes um, with all different pitches, which was quite a challenge to me because I'm not a singer. Um, but he, he realized that he could write something for me to sing, and he became very engrossed in doing this and did it repeatedly and made it much more complicated. And uh, I think it was a really helpful game um, in that way. And I, I could not have invented that game unless I'd sat with him at that time, like trying to fight find out what he liked, what he felt comfortable with. So it is really, really, really okay if it takes a long time to find something <laughs> your child likes. Don't feel like you're failing if you sit down to play and you're like, they hate everything. <laughs> it's okay. Um, let's see, I'm checking for the next questions. Um, I think that's all we have here. I'll also say that um, in the handout for this, uh, webinar, I have put um, a link to the DIR model um, uh, the website. They have um, some training programs on there. They are not free, unfortunately, but um, it might be possible to check out some of those. And they still do have a lot of um, sample videos and information. And they give a lot of um, example videos of sitting down and having a play session with your child and practicing some of those very, very basic steps like how, how to have that shyer child initiate something and how to like open up and like 
welcome that when they when they initiate it. And um, it's focused on the DIR model is focused on like developmental appropriateness of the activity, individualizing the activity to the child and making it a relating activity. So all of those are very important to like bridging communication. And um, I think there might be some resources on there that that could be really helpful. Um, they also have some videos on YouTube that you can look at that show like parent and child play sessions that might show a lot of um, self-regulation activities as well. Um, so I would, I would definitely check those out if you have the chance. Let me see. All right, so I see learning about the sense of taste. We took lemon, sugar, and salt and had to ask them how it tastes as they tasted all three. How did they like that? Um, that's a that's a really fun thing. We often like don't use our our sense of taste. Well, I mean, we use it all the time, but we don't acknowledge it as much. It seems like something that's very ingrained in the body. So that's wonderful to have that sensory exploration and then to notice like that felt good or that felt strange and um, these little isolated like novel novel experiences. So we don't want to be overwhelming, but like a new taste and just. Noticing what's happening in our body when we experience that can be really a, a really nice little step to becoming like integrating the senses and our mind and our experience. So I hope that could become like a great like um, experimentation that you do regularly and maybe they'd be curious about like trying things out in the kitchen or um, I also think like a, a nice way of play is allowing children sometimes to imitate adults. Um, so I, I worked in the classroom for a while where there was like a little tiny broom. They would sweep because they saw the adults sweep, not because they were cleaning, but because that's a thing that adults do. <laughs> or if, you're, if your child sees you cooking and they just want to have a, you know, a spoon in a bowl. Um, yes, yes, Montessori has a lot. I see the comment, tasting lemon salt sugar is an activity in Montessori, even smelling lemon spices and recognizing them, good for four-year-olds. Yes, um, I used to be a Montessori teacher. I mean, I guess you're never not a Montessori teacher. <laughs> but I did really um, enjoy the fact that they have a sensory education. So that's another thing maybe to, um, to research if you want to look into Montessori sensory materials, because that can really help children um, who are integrating some senses to like have, they have these very simple matching materials. Um, like you're matching the colors, you're matching, they have a set of bells where you match each tone, um, like this one's high and this one's low. Oh, these are the same. It's a very simple, orderly practice, so it's comfortable for most children, and it, it can be very helpful. Like, ah, okay, that's just to hear one sound in isolation sometimes when everything's buzzing um, can be really reassuring and helpful. Yes, real life, real life practical activities and. Um, so, and by that, Mona, do you mean like the practical activities like imitating the chores? Um, I think those are really, really important. Um, even if the child is not doing it to actually complete a task, it helps them feel like they belong in the family. You know, they are, they are someone who does the things the family does. So if your child is, you know, wants to watch you, you know, get your clothes ready in the morning and they want to they want to try and do it too. Or if they, um, they see you doing anything around the house and this is, you know, where children are very, <laughs> are our mirrors too. You know, if you see them doing something in that, um, that you're like, that's, that's strange. Why are they always tense at this time? Why are we always, um, that's something to notice. They might be telling you something. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a great way. I, I always think, um, too, I've, Sometimes activities are made like, this is a child's activity. You have to learn your hands, uh, learn to wash your hands. And this is something that you have to do. And it's a, it's a lesson that to the child might feel separate from the community or from the family. Like if it's too much of an exercise, but allowing kids to like imitate something as best they can while you're doing it might help them feel like, oh, this is a way I can learn by doing what you're doing. Ah, I see. I see we have a, a lot of Montessori integration here. Um, I see my seven-year-old cleans tables, washes plates, and hangs out clothes to dry. So these are all great. And, and even if it's something that, um, you know, all of these are activities that could be adapted 
to any child, but I'm, I'm really glad to see that that's something people are learning from. Okay, and I see the, um, the message from Hara saying, Dear attendees, the session's recording will be available on our website by next week, along with our speaker's handout. You will receive the relevant links by email. Thank you. Um, let's see, so I know, are there any other examples out there that people have tried? I'm, I'm really excited to hear the, the variety of things. Maybe, maybe people are having some fun and we shouldn't bother them. <laughs> also, um, because someone has asked and because it is really important, if any parents want to share like how they handle stress, um, what is most helpful to them, um, I, I can share that with the group as well because it is really, really important. Like you said, when you're, when you're playing with your child, um, they're, they're going to feel your feelings. So it's important to have some time to have your own stress release. And I will, I will say it is, it can be really challenging to teach children um, stress release uh, or, or relaxation because we often like focus on the the breathing and it's really um it can be tough for kids who are maybe not like picking up all the signals yet you know you teach them deep breathing and they're like <laughs> which is not going to help them relax um it's so one thing i might do is teach them like to squeeze and let go squeeze and let go and they might start to um breathe a little more slowly naturally like that but you could start fast and then slow down <laughs> and see if they can follow you. Um, I think another thing for a lot of kids who can be overstimulated is just to teach them like what feels comfortable to you. If being comfortable to you is being in a dark room with a blanket and, and a teddy bear, then teach them that it's okay sometimes to go get those things and make themselves feel better. And if they, they need to take a safety object with them when they're going to places, that's completely fine if, if it's going to help them do something new. I would definitely support that. Oh, I'm glad you found it very helpful. I'm also, um, if, it's, if it's okay, um, Hara, I was going to put my email in the chat in case people had questions later. Uh, I just wanted to check with you. Yes. <laughs> And I see a comment, playing with kids can help us relieve stress. We should do it to enjoy it as parents as well, not just for the kids. Yes, yes, because when we do it just for the kids, it's an activity that we're making them do for a good reason. And when we're playing for ourselves, um, it's a real life thing. It's what humans do. <laughs> and we're just welcoming to get to do this, be with us. Okay, so I'm gonna put um, my uh, email into, here for everyone. So if you would like to take that down and you want to write a question to me later. <laughs> yes, yes, they are little humans. <laughs> and they need to definitely be welcomed and like you are one of us and like come enjoy the world with us. Um, hopefully that that inspires us a little. Um, so my email is in the chat or it will be in just a second. That way if you have questions at any time Later, please, I'm happy to meet new people. <laughs> I'm happy to say hello. Um, it might take me a little bit of time to respond, but that's only because I want to be thoughtful and not send you a, a quick uh, rushed answer. Let me see. Um, I will very quickly also if, um, I'll wait for more questions, but while we're doing that, I can also show you like a quick, I was gonna do this earlier, but I noticed we were getting tight on time, but I have these little dolls that don't require any sewing. They're, they're very fun. <laughs> they're very like silly little dolls, but again, just like the, um, the little squeezable pillow people that the student wanted to make, um, they seem to inspire a lot more play, a lot more interaction than like regular dollhouse dolls. So the very easy way to make these and and it actually is challenging for some children to wrap it tightly enough. They might need a little bit of help, but with some practice, most kids can do that because it's really, 
the only action is to wrap really tightly. Um, actually, I know a couple of kids that that's their most favorite thing to do is to wrap things really tightly. But so I just take any soft fabric like this, about this size, a little piece of tissue or a ball of something soft so you have kind of a head. So it looks like a little, a little ghosty. Um, you know, and then we wrap it really tight to make the head. And you take one corner, pull it out so it's like a little arm, and then wrap it really tight. The first couple ones are, are a little bit challenging for kids. They might need some help, but then as you go down the arm, wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap. And you can wrap really fast or really slow, depending on what the kids need. And then wrap back up to the body and find another corner pinch it off, and this, this will be the other arm. And you wrap it and wrap it and wrap it. And some kids will make it so it's just a shoulder. Some kids wanna wrap it all the way down to where the fingertips would be. Just as long, it doesn't have to be too um, specific. It can, it can work either way. And then we go down and we get the next corner for a leg and then another corner for the other leg. I'm doing this one a little bit quickly. Um, this is also an activity, whenever you have anything where you're tying, or like binding something up, that can also be a stress release. Um, it, it gives kind of a feeling of security. So this like wrapping, 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 can sometimes be very comforting in itself for the child. And then I would just, you know, tie a knot for them. And they have this little person who's not quite poseable, but they, I think one of the reasons why they're so interesting is because they are soft and squeezable, but also because um, they have these interesting little poses, like doing a victory dance or, <laughs> like, you know, this guy's maybe having a little bit of a harder day. <laughs> so, so they, they just seem to inspire a lot more. I have a lot of kids like tell a story about themselves through this, you know, like he's very frustrated today. He's very angry because he hit his mom and he's got to go to timeout. And they would never tell me that about themselves. But this little guy will, will go through the whole story. Um, okay, so I just wanted to um, thank everyone again for coming. Um, if there are any last questions, we have a couple more minutes. And then um, remember, you do have my, uh, my email in the chat right now if you would like to make sure you have that before we go. Um, also, Hara, if anybody asks for it later, that is fine. Um, oh, OK, I will put the email in one more time. Because okay, I'm seeing some people said it wasn't there, so I'm, I'm Putting it back out. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much to um, everyone for coming. I know it can be really hard to make time in your day. And I know we've all been on Zoom quite a lot. <laughs> um, I'm sorry I can't see your faces, but um, I just I want to wish you the best uh, in working with your children and finding some enjoyment in this really, really stressful time. Mm. And just a second.